2005 brought the discovery of Eris, a spacecraft landing on Titan, North Korea announcing its possession of nuclear weapons, the first ever YouTube video, and fear. Not the emotion, the video game. Obviously. But is it obvious? For something called Fear, you wouldn't expect a game born from a concept to make an action movie in a first-person shooter, where you really felt like an action star. Fear stood for First Encounter Assault Recon, because it was not only a horror game, but an action game as well. One of those aspects immortalised Fear, and the other was nothing more than a footnote. One was the focus of the gameplay, and another was the focus of the story. Can you guess which was which? When I started Fear after having finished my series on Crisis, I was shocked to discover that it ran awfully. What? The game can't exactly compete with Crisis on a graphical level, so what was the cause? My mouse. No, seriously, it was. Fear hates all Logitech hardware, forcing any owners of such a mouse or keyboard to have to go into the device manager and disable all the HID compliant devices. After which, it runs smoothly on the hardware of today above 300 FPS, which makes the game's reflex-reliant gameplay dramatically easier to handle. Compared to Crisis, the performance gap is night and day, but it might surprise you to know that before 2007, this was the game that people considered the cream of the graphical crop. Seriously? The game that looks like it has environments designed by someone with the creativity of a teaspoon? Fear might not be the best looking game based just off its environments, but it sure is once there's been a fight. The game likes to believe it's a horror game, so naturally there's a lot of blood and gore. If you pump a soldier full of lead, the walls are going to tell the story. If the gun you're using happens to be the particle weapon, they'll burst into nothing more than a charred, electrified skeleton. Certain kill conditions such as explosions or a point-blank shotgun blast will allow enemies to dissolve into a red mist. And if you're shooting, especially in slow-mo, dust and sparks fly across your screen as if you're standing in the middle of an explosion. But that's just shooting. Imagine how the game actually does explosions. Grenades will not only blow you into a restart and enemies into wallpaper paste, but they'll also create an earth-shattering sound as they shake your screen and pulverize all the surrounding physics objects. Glass will fall like rain from all the broken windows, boxes and paper will explode. Load. It's a power in explosions never captured like this since. Then there's the bump map textures which allow bullet holes to appear 3D on walls, ceilings and floors, and the dust that's kicked up if enough bullets are fired into a solid surface. I'm glad the game does this not only because it looks drop dead gorgeous, but also because it means if you ever lose your bearings in a level, you need only look at a room to see if you've been there before. The bodies, bullet holes and fresh coat and paint will tell you everything you need to know. And if enough bullets have been fired at you, the dust kicked up means you quite literally can't see anything past it, so you're going going to need to reposition. An incredible way of preventing camping. If that's not the most impressive use of graphics and gameplay I've ever seen, then I'll eat my hat. Ah, oh, for fuck's sake. The lighting is legendarily good. Lith Engine used a bunch of big words that I don't understand, such as light mapping, volumetric lighting, and a per pixel lighting model, to create some of the best lighting effects around. Shadows are used by the horror very often, and you can also see enemies before you've even entered a room. It's a cool experience to immediately corner a wall and open fire on someone because you knew exactly where they'd be based on only their shadow. Sometimes the placement is blatantly intentional, sometimes you can use them dynamically to see where enemies are going to appear from. But it doesn't end there. Your shockingly short lived flashlight alerts AI so you need to make sure it's off the moment you enter an arena if you want to benefit from the fact that unalert enemies take far less damage than alert ones. You need to live in the shadows to become a better predator. It plays into the horror sequence as much as the combat ones. The flashlight having a ridiculously short battery life means that when you're lighting up dark areas, it won't take long to blink out. Either you keep that in mind and feel the urge to get to safety before it does, or you forget and it suddenly turns off in the dark. Stay out of my way. I believe the game is programmed to play certain voice lines if that happens. Chris Hubbard states that Fear's horror was about getting under your skin, and I'm doubtless that the flashlight is the most successful example of that. But the lighting wasn't what Fear was made a legend for, nor was its graphics, its story, or its horror. People remember Fear because of its combat. It's what made Fear, and where else to start but with the point man. You aren't just any special operations dude bro, you can slow down time itself in reflex mode and perform a variety of martial arts melee attacks. There's the roundhouse kick for when you're standing still the bicycle kick for when you're moving, and the slide kick for when you're crouched. Except not really, because you have to press melee then crouch. Uh, yeah, the melee controls don't make any sense whatsoever, but to be fair it does make combos easier since you have the initial melee and then can swap targets for the follow-up with only two button inputs needed. Once you have mastered them, you're a grade A badass.
There's nothing like turning a group of soldiers into bullet pinatas with a submachine gun in reflex mode and then finishing off the last one with a bicycle kick. The increased reaction time you get in slow mo allows for easy headshots, reduced damage since you can dodge bullets, and even the ability to shoot explosives in mid-air. Reflex mode's a lot of fun, but it's also necessary to your survival, because without it you're gonna need to react in an instant. The point man's got quite the arsenal at his disposal, with not only the basic dual pistols, frag, proximity and remote grenades, submachine gun, assault rifle and iconic shotgun, but also a particle laser a repeater cannon, a penetrator, and a multi-rocket launcher. You get to play with all the cool toys plenty by the end of the game, and that's a good thing, mostly. There are a few issues. Firstly, the penetrator might stick enemies to walls on kill, but its RPM means it fires too slowly to be fun in reflex mode, which you'll be in all the time. And you often need to take breaks between shots, since the gun requires pinpoint accuracy to be effective. Secondly, the remote grenades are useless unless you have no other grenades. If I wanted to lay a trap, why would I not use the proximity grenades which will detonate at the perfect time without any input, and allow me to use my weapons without needing this pen clicker equipped. They're good against turrets because they stick to ceilings and walls, but that's the extent of their use. Thirdly, the dual pistols are awesome, but any time you accidentally swap them out, you lose the second pistol. Considering the already limited ammo you have for them, losing my gun by accident all the time meant I never got to play with them as much as I wanted. And finally, the particle weapon is broken. Yes, it blows people into a red mist and reduces their corpse into an electrified skeleton, but it's also a one-shot kill on every infantry unit for the entire game apart from the last two missions, and it's not like you're strapped for ammo. It's insanely overpowered. It's better than the shotgun at point blank and better than the ASP rifle at long range thanks to its accuracy and scope. It makes any specialized guns totally irrelevant, and if you're under any stress, you're going to forego using your favorite weapons to instead use the particle gun and turn every arena into a slaughter. It's only only counter is the player stopping themselves from using it. Thankfully, it's not hard to do once you realize how much more fun it is to turn the cheats off. The other power weapons in the game are the multi-rocket launcher, which fires four separate rockets at a time. It's meant to be used against mechs, but as you can imagine, it has no issues with infantry either, even if it is wasteful. Same deal with the repeater cannon. It has 25 rounds most of the time, otherwise there's only 10. So despite how fun it is to blow your enemies into next Tuesday, it's unwise to spend it all on easy infantry. The particle weapon is the perfect example to prove that flashy animations and mindless brutality aren't enough to keep the player entertained. There's got to be proper game mechanics to back it up. This is a video on Fear, so it was only a matter of time until we got onto the AI. By now, Fear AI has a reputation that would have you believe it would grow self-aware and hack the world's nuclear codes if you left your game on for too long. Fear AI applies to four different enemy types if we aren't counting the demon bombers. You've got your giant heavy units who take huge amounts of damage and dish it back out with their penetrator guns. They take a knee to reduce their hitboxes, but there's nothing special about them other than that. Much like the mechs who present as boss enemies on occasion throughout the game. They fire multi-rocket launchers at you which you can easily strafe if you've got the space. They serve as the only real motivation to conserve your power ammo and not much else. It was the basic infantry units that gave fear its reputation. They'll rush you if they outnumber you and you're in close proximity. They'll hip fire when moving and ADS while behind cover. They won't wait in a room. If you retreat, they'll push. They'll throw objects in the environment down in front of you to block your path. They'll take cover that actually protects them and reposition appropriately. They'll throw grenades if you're behind cover to flush you out. They'll flank if the arena allows them to do so. They'll retreat logically and use cover fire to protect themselves. They'll crouch to make themselves a smaller target and go prone to crawl under smaller spaces. The list goes on. We all know what Fear AI can do. People a billion years from now can just read the stone tablets if they ever forget. But why is it good? Thanks to Dr. Tommy Thompson, whose channel I will link in the description, I found out. What makes AI good? Well, let's start with a name. Artificial intelligence. As in, it's an intelligence, able to predict and respond to a range of stimuli. For a shooter like Fear with human enemies, AI needs to act like a human if it wants to be believable, challenging, and immersive. So where do we start? Well, Fear is a video game which means it's run on a computer. The computer will always know where you are, what each enemy entity is doing, what state the enemy is in, and what you're doing. If you give an AI all of that information and program it to kill the player, it's not going to be very fair, or believable. 
So you restrict the amount of things that it can respond to. You only activate its attack objectives when you've entered a certain radius around the enemy model's head. You screw with its accuracy so it can't immediately blow your brains out as soon as it opens fire. You give it a reaction animation so it can't immediately start dealing damage the instant you're detected. None of these traits are rare, there aren't many shooters around that lack them, but at the core of the decision making process, you have a planning system. AI needs to be able to make a logical plan to carry out its goals based on the state of the world. Unfortunately for fear, most planning systems were very demanding and that was a big deal for a reflex based FPS that needs every drop of performance it can get. So what Monolith did was use an approach called goal oriented action planning. This involves implementing a finite state machine to generalize everything a planning system needs to consider. Here's an image for an example. What you see on screen is the extent of the finite state machine. That's it. Yeah, it's really that simple. Go to just involves the enemy moving to a location which will allow it to do a bunch of different actions depending on where it's moved to. Animate is simply doing an animation necessary for immersion and often balance. And then there's Smart Object, which is just animate again but slightly more specialised. Performing a grenade throw animation would be animate, but flipping a stack of shelves to block your path or diving through glass is a Smart Object, because it's only possible in the context of that exact location, that specific piece of cover. That is how the AI generally works, but the process of deciding which things to do is decided by a search algorithm which considers a number of goals and actions. For example, goals in fear might be to go to kill enemy, to action, to cover, and to ambush. And to carry out these goals they have nine possible actions. To idle, to attack, to dodge shuffle, to dodge roll, to attack melee, to go to a node, to attack from cover, to dodge while covered, and to blind fire from cover. The search algorithm is what decides which actions to perform in order to achieve the given goal, and it considers a range of data relative to the entire squad of soldiers, each individual soldier, the environment, and you. In Fear's case the algorithm used was A star. It's rather basic, but it kept costs down and it got the job done. This is all basic stuff not unheard of in 2005, but what made Fear AR unique was threefold. Level design, the illusion of communication, and the fear of the AI itself. Fear uses a very common system called a squad brain. Any enemy entities in a certain radius of one another will become part of a squad, and when you're detected, it'll delegate commands to each entity. One might be commanded to flank, one might take cover, one might be firing on the spot. It'll also stop enemy entities from getting too close to each other and straying too far apart. There are four different squad commands. Get to cover, pretty self-explanatory. Cover advance, which commands all squad members to move into closer cover. Orderly advance, which moves enemies protected by covering fire. And search, which has enemies search. That's it. That's the range of coordinated enemy manoeuvres in fear. But that simple system alone isn't what made fear unique. A quote from Dr. Thompson. The overall goal of NPCs in fear is not to kill the player. Their goal is to eliminate threat. The best thing about this implementation is that the threat you present and the range of actions bots can take gives plenty of scope for engaging behaviour. Eliminating a threat doesn't have to mean killing you. It means getting rid of a threat to the individual enemy. Remember earlier when I said that for a shooter like fear, believability acting like a human means everything. An AI doesn't have a fear of death, but fear AI does. If I aim my gun at an enemy, instead of aiming down sights and shooting as accurately as possible at my head, the enemy will move out of my line of sight and maybe hit fire to follow, because it prioritizes its own life over killing me. This goes so far that it allows any individual enemy to override squad commands. If it's calculated that a squad command is likely to get an individual soldier killed, like if it had to walk over a grenade or straight into your line of sight, its overall goal goal to eliminate threat will override the squad command. That is largely responsible for why the AI in fear is so believable and so satisfying to play against. Given how simple a design choice it is, the difference in quality is staggering. It's all about creating the illusion of human-like decision making, and that is plainly audible. And I mean that literally. In game you'll hear the radio chatter of the replica communicating except they aren't actually communicating. Voice lines are simply played depending on what goals and actions the AI have and what information it knows about the player. The soldiers don't have eyes nor do they have detective-like abilities. When you move behind a wall in a detected state, the game just plays the appropriate voice line to create an illusion. Of course, the voice lines weren't just for the sake of making the AI look cool. They're also a hugely important gameplay element. You can respond to a grenade being thrown at you before it's even left the enemy's hand if you're paying attention. You can deduce pretty much every enemy manoeuvre the AI is making and respond to it before it's even happened. You can predict how many enemies remain based on the emotional state of the chatter. If they're telling each other to shut the fuck up, it's because they're scared and there's only two or three left. 
The voice lines exist to balance a ruthless AI against you, who can be killed in seconds, and to keep the pace of combat high. You rarely have to stay put, guessing, you just have to pay attention and respond accordingly. It's what makes the AI's power fair. You'll never be killed to a grenade that you couldn't have known was there. On top of all that, we return to the believability and human-like goals of AI design. The fact that you can tell when they're scared, what they're thinking, and what they're planning creates not just an illusion of communication, but also personality. I think it's probably those voice lines that gave people the delusion that fear AI was two steps from Skynet. It's not. It's just very good. But having very good AI isn't going to create satisfying combat on its own. Your level design needs to facilitate it. Or your AI needs to facilitate your level design. It works both ways, and that's the point. They work in tandem. In fear, the AI designers had to have known what each smart node would be, and what objects the soldiers could use for cover. The dev who did the voiceovers had to have known what each AI action and goal would be, and every place that the player could hide behind. Monolith knew what they would do. Doing. Fear's level design is highly iterative of classic FPS templates, a relatively linear structure of rooms and corridors built with the purpose of getting you from arena to arena, all while keeping you entertained and of course building an atmosphere with minor traversal and navigational challenges. The level design isn't meant to feel like a real space, it's meant to guide you down the appropriate paths and facilitate the AI's abilities when creating combat arenas. The AI flank so much because there are so many routes that they can take to get behind you. I was confused as to why there's so much empty space and unused rooms in Fear's arenas until that clicked. It's space for them to hide, for them to flank unseen, for them to take cover. The almost maze-like structure of rooms, stairs, and floors means there's walls surrounding you all the time. It keeps combat relatively close quarters and means that there's very little room for enemy pathfinding to go wrong. You also have to consider sight lines. Those rooms, stairs, and floors block your sight of the enemy, meaning you don't always know where they'll come from. You don't know when a flank is coming, and you can't simply mow everyone down before the AI has its time to shine. The level design doesn't just facilitate facilitate the AI, it protects them from you, just as the voice line protect you from them. Even the windows play to the game's favour. Some glass is reinforced, some is breakable. The breakable glass allows AI to shoot you from another room if you aren't paying attention, but it can also be just as much a weapon for you. See an enemy? Just line up a shot and it'll fly straight through the glass. Grenades won't be stopped by it either. The ideal scenario I describe here is the vast majority of the game, and its importance becomes clear once you experience how badly the combat falls apart without it. The level design from missions 1 to 3 ranges from serviceable to awful, reaching its low point at the end of mission 3. Fear is a game that needs close quarters, it's where the AI shines best, but it's by no means vital for them. It is vital for you though, down to the literal meaning of the word. Long range arenas means you can't really fight back without taking a significant amount of damage yourself, because there's not enough cover and because the vast majority of guns are meant for CQC. You've got two options in such a situation, move around while taking a buttload of damage, or stick in one spot leaning out to fire back. The first is pointless and the second is boring. You can reposition using reflex mode to dodge a good amount of incoming bullets, but unless the cover you want to reposition to is better than the one you're in, it's still pointless as is true for Mission 3's final arena. Thankfully, the majority of arenas in the game do keep engagements close, allowing you to move about, but not being able to reliably prevent damage is an issue that sadly shows itself in all combat encounters in the game. Avoiding damage is very difficult to almost impossible. If you're in a position to be dealing damage, you're sure as shit going to be taking it as well. Reflex mode allows you to dodge about 50% of damage on average. If you're strafing from side to side in front of an enemy, reflex mode will prevent up to 100%. That figure decreases if you add more enemies and increases if you throw in a jump. If you're going towards or away from enemy fire without moving horizontally, which can be forced on you in corridor fights, reflex mode helps a lot less. Regardless, situations in which you can reliably prevent taking damage are incredibly rare due to two things, accuracy model and movement. Enemies are generally highly accurate in fear, and when you combine that with your total lack of movement abilities, apart from a jump and a useless crouch, it's easy to see where the problem lies. Thing is, this was intentional. It's simply an artifact of the classic FPS formula for which most of fear's design is based off. And it's why adding a sprint function to allow you to dodge bullets easier would effectively ruin the entire game, because the level design relies on you having a set speed. The only way you can stay alive in fear is by almost rhythmically using medkits, which are handed out endlessly throughout the game. You need to tap the heal button every 5 seconds if you aren't in reflex mode, and that's kind of the point. If you don't want to keep your eye on your health bar constantly throughout the flow of battle, you need to use the reflex as much as possible. That's instilled into the player, be it intentional or not, the moment they try to enter a fight with our reflex mode. You'll be slaughtered if you aren't playing extremely defensive because your health bar will drop far quicker than you can align accurate headshots while you and the enemy is moving. Just try playing the game without slow-mo on any difficulty above normal. It gives CSGO a run for its money.
The problem with this is that you'll never want to try playing without reflex due to how many medkits you need to use to stay alive. It's wasteful. You're constantly in reflex mode. If you aren't, you're retreating, in cover, or dead. And so after a while, the non-stop use of slow-mo causes its effect to wear off. Medkits and non-rechargeable health, while a tried and tested design choice, was in my opinion not the best choice for Fear's combat. And I don't think copying Halo's rechargeable shields was the right choice either. You should have the freedom of movement to allow you to prevent damage along with reasonably recharging health. Carefully reduce enemy accuracy and combine that with perhaps giving the player a dive animation or the ability to grab your foes and use them as shields, a slide that you can shoot from as well as the current slide kick. This way you would have more freedom in both reflex mode and at normal speed. You could avoid all damage and keep the pace of combat going like a dormouse on speed all with the implementation of a more skill-based movement system. It could also take the doom route of having slow-moving projectiles whose paths you can easily walk out of, though Fear's bullet firing weapons are kind of its thing so I don't know how well that would fly. Having written about 4,000 words on Fear's combat, my only complaints have been that you can't avoid damage reliably, creating a need for the constant use of medkits and an over-reliance on reflex mode some weak level design early on, the particle weapon being OP, the remote grenade being useless, a bug with the pistol, and the penetrator's RPM being too slow. I'd say in a game immortalized for its combat, Fear's done pretty well. If you have any love for the FPS genre or action games in general, and you don't own Fear, buy it. Recently, thanks to Warner Brothers, the Fear collection is now $60. A curious price increase for a 13-year-old game, huh? Yeah, get it on sale or from anywhere that sells it for a reasonable price. Just don't go in expecting a horror a masterpiece to go along with the combat. To explain Fear's darker half, we're first gonna have to run through the story. The game opens with a cutscene detailing a guy going mental, screaming really loud, and an army of soldiers being woken by that scream. You then take control of the Point Man in a Fear base of operations. Apparently, some shit's going down, and that screaming guy is called Paxton Fatal, who's telepathically linked with those soldiers. From there, you're left to piece the backstory together by yourself. Most of the game's backstory is presented through messages on answering machines. Much of it makes no sense, but there's often mention of a vault and a project origin. Everyone involved sounds incredibly worried, referring to past events and whether or not they should reopen the vault. Some messages refer to a she, and that something awful happened to people who went near her. You can tell that the key players are an extremely angry Harlan Wade and a Genevieve R. Steed who's done something wrong but believes she still has control, both of whom work to Armacam, a military contractor. Other than answering machines, there's laptops littered about too, with more hard evidence as to what's going on. I figured out what a synchronicity event is. There was an incident where they lost control of Fettel. He just suddenly started freaking out. He was only about 10 years old at the time, but I guess he killed a few people. In the investigation, they discovered that there had been a telepathic link between Fettel and Alma, even though she was in a coma. They concluded that she was influencing him. That must have been why they pulled the plug on Origin. Fear leaving it to you to deduce the game's backstory could be perceived as lazy, but I took it as both liberating and engaging. If you don't care about the backstory, you don't need to pay attention to it. You can just go on through the levels, skipping every voice message. But if you do, you get to compile all the information to come up with an idea of what's going on and what needs to be done. Sure, development costs were probably a consideration, but this solution is both player-friendly and immersive. I'd say a part of it also comes down to Monolith knowing they didn't have a story worth bringing to life. The reason Fear's backstory is so mysterious and atmospheric is because it's presented in this format, with nothing being clear. There's always so many questions being raised and answered. That's good, because it's the only worthwhile narrative note the game ever has. The fleeting story of the game itself is so forgettable that I've already forgotten it. Referring to a wiki, you go to a shipping yard because Paxton's been detected there, and you need to kill him to sever his control of the replica. That doesn't work out too well. You screw around with Paxton a bit, and then in mission 4, you follow him to the armor cam offices where you free Aldous Bishop, a surviving employee, for questioning. I don't think that goes very well either. Harlan Wade's name comes up on multiple occasions, so to get to him you find his daughter, Alice Wade, who's also trapped in this office complex. This woman. Oh boy. So, she's scared of flying, which is why she'd rather take her car instead of this black hawk we've got waiting for her on the roof. She gives up protection and a helicopter ride to her father, then decides to trek through a building home to an army of telepathically controlled remorseless soldiers, and then drive to an even more dangerous facility all by herself because she's scared of flying. 
right. Let's just not question it. You meet Norton Mapes in the same building, a fat IT technician who ends up being Mission 6's antagonist. He screws you about multiple times and hacks the building's security to target you. The game believes he's supposed to be funny, but I don't see it. You can't give a ridiculously fat guy a silly voice and play generic comedy music whenever he shows up and expect people to laugh. The one and only time the game's humour hit the right notes was in Mission 7 when you're rescuing Alice. You're in an elevator and there's goofy music playing. The replica call the elevator to every floor they're on to ambush you, so every time the elevator door opens you just shoot them, the door closes and it's on to the next group for about three times, all while this elevator music plays. It's not exactly Jimmy Carr, but it's good enough for a game called Fear. This sucks. Eventually, you do make it into the vault, and as was foreshadowed, it is where this grudge girl lives. Basically, Harlan Wade has entered the vault with Norton's help. He shoots Norton for some reason and goes inside, closing the door behind him. Norton tells you that you've got to reroute power to the vault door to get inside yourself. So, you do that. Paxton eventually shows up again, eating Alice's corpse this time, and he explains to you that you were born here and he's your brother. He reminds you that you've got no personality or backstory to speak of, you have no memory of events prior to fear. And yeah, that is a really cool play on the silent protagonist thing. You don't seem to react to this, however, as long as you aren't counting shooting Paxton in the head. He's just dead now, apparently, and I assume Alice isn't going to walk that off. You go into the vault and Harlan opens this giant containment cell thing. He wants Alma to be free for some reason. She gets out and it's revealed to you that she's kinda your mother and Harlan's kinda her dad. She's called Alma Wade. Yes, the little kid who gets experimented on is the child of the experimenter. I'm guessing that Harlan felt guilty and wanted to right his wrongs by freeing her. It's not like she's basically the Antichrist or anything. She's not particularly appreciative of his gesture and immediately blows him up. Fair enough. As for you being her kid, it's heavily implied that that's the case, hence the super reflex abilities. The scream you constantly hear in the hospital visions you see on occasion throughout the game is her scream when you were taken from her after birth. According to Harlan, before Alma painted the walls with him, she died after childbirth. Well, fuck lot of good that did. If Paxton wanted to free her, and Harlan wanted to free her, then why didn't they just work together? And if she's dead and her body's being stored in the vault, what good is opening it going to do? Does a ghost get even more ghoster if it's body isn't in a giant black sphere? Anyway, you leave while being attacked by these ghost zombie things. They're a bore to fight because they can only rush you in a straight line and each take one hit, so the game throws a small army of them at you to balance. Alma's power specifically don't seem to have changed much after opening the vault, if we don't include the fact that she sometimes grows slightly taller. But there's not much time to ponder that since you'll be so busy running away from a nuclear meltdown. This was a really cool section. You just have to sit there and watch as the fireball explodes towards you. After you're exposed to solar temperatures, untold levels of radiation, a super powerful shockwave, and of course a city's worth of debris, you wake up no problem and leave the city with the rest of fear on a helicopter. Or at least you think you do. Spooky bitch. After the credits roll, you hear Genevieve Aristide deeming the point man a success. Given her position at Armacam, I assume she knew you were Alma's son and that you would end up covering up all the evidence by blowing the vault to kingdom come. Fair sequel bait and a possible explanation as to how you suddenly ended up working for fear. The backstory was presented in an entertaining and engaging manner, I'll admit, but that only gets the game so far. The plot itself is senseless and unoriginal. All the characters are woefully underdeveloped. Paxton's motivations make no sense and he spends the entire game saying mildly creepy stuff to you instead of just getting to the point. Logical for a horror game, but not for a story. Alice gets the most screen time of all the non-villain characters and she's only there for five minutes. Norton is initially just cheap comedy relief and then gets shot for no reason. Why is he even helping Harlan? Speaking of whom, why would he go to all of that trouble to free his daughter when he knows full well that she's a demon witch who's killed countless innocent people? Because he feels guilty? None of the Fear team do anything at all and you won't even remember their names by the time the game returns you to the main menu. I think the Point Man twist was a pretty cool play on the silent protagonist despite the plethora of questions that raises. Like, why do Alma and Paxton spend the entire game spooking you and very often almost getting you killed if they know who you really are and want you to know it too? There's no point in trying to find sense in this because there is none. It's nothing more than context for the horror.
Sphere might be the most inappropriately named game of all time. Firstly, that is the most ridiculous assortment of military jargon I've ever seen in my entire life. And secondly, in my honest opinion, it's not even remotely scary. Fear is one of the most overt horror games of all time, by which I mean the horror is as in your face and unsubtle as it possibly could be. It uses two major techniques to convey its horror, the first being gore. There's a lot of blood, plenty of messy skeletons and many brutal scenes, some orchestrated by you, some not. Gore can be used very effectively if its use is sparing. There can be a lot of shock value if a character in a horror flick is suddenly decapitated, but if the entire movie is just blood and guts, it tends not to be as scary. Doom is a great example rip and tear, but there's not much fear. Exceptions might include Final Destination and Saw, but there, it's less meant to create fear, more to create suspense in anticipation of when the brutal death will occur. You're supposed to cringe at Final Destination, not be directly afraid of it. The art in those movies is how they raise the tension. A million things can be what kills the character. You never know what it'll be and when it'll hit. There's no skill needed to get someone to cringe at gore itself. We're all programmed to be revolted by it, so we'll be put off no matter what. That is fear's use of gore and the furthest it ever goes is showing you some skeletons sometimes. When Fear's Fear isn't being sold to you with spooky scary skeletons, it's with Alma, or more accurately, what she represents, which is cliches. Japanese horror cliches in this case. A small child in a red dress with long black hair and dropped shoulders is a horror element that was so tired even in 2005 that it might as well just drop dead at this point. If Fear was the first game to use it, it might have been genuinely disturbing, but I'm simply not capable of being scared by this image anymore. It wasn't spooky at the start of the game, believe me, it's not spooky eight hours after. Along with her appearance, you'll get plenty of infant giggling and the like to top it all off. She's just one cliche though. You'll be constantly shown weird visions of experiments in a bloody hospital fire, but since they're so frequent and haven't got an original bone in their stupid skeleton, they just make me sigh as I get my control ripped away once again. There'll also be plenty of jump scares in the form of random horrific images popping up in your face, which don't work at all. They're predictable and strangely too subtle to actually have an intense jump effect, but I'm more thankful for that than put off. The only level of jump effect the game does achieve is thanks to its sound design. Heavy breathing and heart pounding sound effects along with the unknown signal static noise are used to create dread allowing the next jump scare to have the maximum effect. Just by moving, you'll knock a lot of the physics objects in the environment about. Bottles, chairs, any litter on the floor. It creates that sort of, oh my god, I made a noise sensation dynamically, especially since you'll never know if it was you or a ghost. And that is praiseworthy. I don't go into a lot of detail, but I guess the place is really dangerous something. What isn't praiseworthy is the incessant use of that screech whenever something that's supposed to be scary happens. It's incredibly cheap and a horse so beaten that there's just a few scraps of meat left by the time the credits roll. Most of Fear's unsettling atmosphere is generated by music. You can tell if you're entering a combat section or a spooky section by that alone, and it makes the horror extremely predictable until they try to mix it up later on. You would be shocked to see how different the atmosphere of the game becomes without the music on. It alone creates that unsettling atmosphere after the first few missions, because the effect of blinking lights, never ending blood splatter and randomly strewn corpses wear off after the 17th millionth time. Usually, any time the game restricts your movement, you can tell there's something coming. Like when you're on a ladder, crawling through a cooling tunnel, or in an elevator. It's got you vulnerable, you're trapped, and you can't run. But the moment you figure out the pattern, which is obvious by Mission 3, none of them can surprise you anymore. Monolith knew that, so they employed a tactic that is, in my opinion, the only reason the game's horror is anywhere close to competent. They set up something that obviously looks like a scare, and have it mean nothing. They do this all the time, and if you're looking for it, it's clearly intentional. It's all to keep you you guessing and it pays off when they start breaking convention in the latter half of the game. It's no longer spooky section into combat section into spooky section over and over, but the spooks randomly pop up where you least expect it in the middle of two arenas, or where you're certain there's going to be another room full of horrible demons and ghosts, there's the replica waiting for you. It's good when they mix it up, but it doesn't totally dispel the predictability of it all. It becomes obvious that some places are supposed to be ruses, so if you've learnt to look for it, they can't trick you. But I still think it did its job effectively. It's really smart horror design and 
and it's not just the predictability that improves after Mission 3. In Missions 4 to 5 alone, Paxton stops jump scaring you, instead weaving in and out of the plywood constructions. His presence is scary, but he never does anything cheap. The elevator arena where you hear the bells in sequence of the soldiers arriving to kill you was a good use of sound design to create tension. They may be trying to box you in. The best use of horror in the game by far, though, was this. You start being shown glimpses of some kind of invisible enemy in Mission 3. You've seen something suspicious moving about five times by the time they actually attack, so when they do, it's a heart stopper. I remember firing my entire shotgun clip into the air and shouting fuck out loud. These replica assassins work by meleeing you, then immediately running away, going invisible and hiding. They're able to hide in the upper corners of rooms and jump large distances. The only thing you've got to go on is a small invisible outline. It's a shame that the game never deployed these enemies along with the normal foot soldiers, since on their own they're easily dispatched once you've gotten over your fear and learned to use reflex mode. In Mission 4, the subtlety, nuance, and working of the horror elements into the gameplay makes that aspect of the game effective for the first time. It continues that trend with enemies hiding behind rotating doors and then suddenly opening when you pass by in Mission 7. The cars suddenly exploding out at you and forcing you to run for your life in Mission 8 were a high point too. I think the horror and fear is often excellent, but for every scare that was well earned, built up, incorporated into the gameplay, and used creative ideas, there was one that had me smack my hand into my face and laugh. I believe this, and I think Monolith realised it too. I don't think it's a coincidence that the horror improves so much as the game progresses, and I don't think it's a coincidence that the proportion of combat to horror sections drop dramatically as you get past Mission 3. The game's horror might have been a lot better if it applied its superb use of artificial intelligence to its horror elements. Think Alien Isolation, now one of the most AI-driven games ever made. Having something hunt you to replace the scripted jump scares or spooky visions would have given fear a right to have its name. By both applying the horror to the gameplay itself, and by linking combat and the horror in such a way that it feels natural and not like two different games grafted onto one another. There's a countless number of ideas for what such an AI would be, but taking the the most obvious of them all, Alma, and giving her the ability to dynamically hunt you down would amplify the horror by not only making it scary, but also by creating a contrast between the mind states of Hunter and Hunted. I would accept that development costs would be too high to create such a system in place of easy scripted animations, but this is fear. They have the AI, they have the know-how. They could create something that used the horror elements already present in the game to do so, such as blinking lights, the physics objects, the animations, the detection mechanics, and the flashlight system. These things are already present in every arena in the entire game. Now just let an AI mess with them. Imagine if the physics objects would shake and shuffle and light would blink or go out whenever Alma approached the player. Perhaps blood textures and bodies would spawn and despawn between blinks of a light. These are just small ideas amongst a forest of potential for AI-controlled horror and fear that will sadly never come to pass. I initially thought that I would have enjoyed the game more if there were no horror elements at all, but then I realised it's not the horror that's the problem, it's the story. Paxton, Alma, and the dumb visions don't work at all. They're responsible for the feeling that the horror and the combat aspects were grafted onto one another, not blended as Monolith desired. But the lighting, the replica, and the assassins are both effective as horror and gameplay elements. It's not obnoxious when you're scared by them, it's thrilling. That makes all the difference, and I wouldn't have the game without them. I don't think it's impossible to mix action FPS with horror, as the game's strokes of brilliance proves, but I don't think it's practical either. With that, fear draws to a close. A game with combat nothing short of masterful, marred with a nonsensical story and hit or miss horror. But in most cases, the use of the word marred would imply an unforgivable drawback. Here, the horror's overall mediocrity only stands out because of how good the rest of the game is. Its enemy design hasn't been matched by literally anything in 13 years. Its blood effects and bump mapped bullet holes make every fight look and feel like nothing else. Fear is a game that deserves its immortalization, your money, and your time. In 2006, Fear Extraction Point would release, effectively bringing us the next six missions in the story, and 2007 would bring Perseus Mandate, the second and final expansion for Fear. These DLCs hail from a time when an expansion wasn't two hours of throwaway content, but a significant portion of the game's original length and with problems from the base game addressed where possible. Both expansion packs, Extraction Point especially, deserve their own videos, and they'll be coming soon after this. Fear also got a sequel in Fear 2 Project Origin and another in Fear 3. I'll be covering both of them as well. 
from what I've heard, Fear 3 is going to be interesting. If you'd like to see any of those videos, do consider subscribing. But before we end, I'd like to do two things. Firstly, re-announce my Discord server, whose link is in the description, and secondly, talk about YouTube's recent monetization threshold changes. Basically, if you're under 1k subs and 4k hours watch in the past year, you get your entire channel's monetization removed. This of course takes away money from small creators regardless of how large that sum is, but the real problem is that demonetized videos generally get far less views due to some algorithmic magic. This means it's harder for small creators to gain popularity and get past the threshold. It's a kick in the teeth. So I'm going to shout out a few people who are being hit by this change and whose content I believe is worth your time. First off we have Squid the Sid. He's at 500 subs and I'd really like to get him past the 1000 mark. He's got a large backlog of Warframe videos and tutorials, but his most notable content is his Dead Cells critique, his Overgrowth critique, and his Singularity 7 Years Later video. This is quality stuff, so perhaps consider checking those out. Next up is Aporia. He's a very new and criminally underrated video essayist with three great videos to check out. His recent Dark Night video was particularly intriguing. And finally, there's Red Value Gaming. He's like IGN, but his reviews actually help you to make informed purchasing decisions. Highly recommended. Ready to go to work? You're putting him in the field? Are you crazy? He just transferred in a week ago.